Hello, and welcome to the Poland Ball official podcast, where me, Koli, and Aaron, C14, talk about everything from the Eastern Hemisphere to the Western Hemisphere, from the Northern Hemisphere to the Irrelevant Hemisphere. We're going to be talking about China, the United States, Israel, and, as we've so desperately wanted to talk about, Ukraine. Koli, do you think that this is going to be an episode where we talk about anything important in the slightest? Absolutely not. All of this stuff doesn't matter. You're all figments of my imagination. Nothing is real. Aaron, do you think that we have anything of value to say with regards to international politics or even, dare I say, country ball comics? Probably not, but I really like to pretend that I'm smart. You heard it here first. Country ball comics, they make you feel smarter. Uh, so with that, I think that we should open things up with sort of, who do you think the good guy is in the Korean War that is still ongoing? Aaron, let's start with you. Well, I think the United Nations and the United States are the good guys, naturally. <laughs> A little bit of bias. I yeah. won't lie, but it's hard to cheer for the uh, Kim regime when they don't let people have television. Has television done good for you? Has it has it brought you happiness? Uh, I guess so. I mean, I get to watch sports. Okay, so, I mean, debate over. I think that that's, you know, one nil for the UN. Uh, Coli, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the straight man, I guess and dive right into the sort of serious talk. Uh, geopolitics does not have good or bad sides. Uh, everything that has to do with politics are shades of gray, generally. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, liberal democracy versus authoritarianism. Um, granted, South Korea wasn't a liberal democracy at the time. Well, by modern standards, nobody was a liberal democracy back then. Yeah, it it's, it's a... Yeah, it's a, it's a definition um, that has evolved over time. You know, the United States, for example, is considered the world's oldest democracy. I think San Marino, isn't it? Um, uh, no, that's the, the oldest country. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The U.S. Right. is the oldest, like, extant uh, country with the, the what's, what's the term? Um, it has the oldest constitution that is still functional, right? Right. Um, yeah, yeah, so, like, right. there are countries, obviously, that are older, right? The U.S. is a new country, but it has had the same form of government for longer than any other country. There are arguments that the UK might, but like the UK was genuinely more of a monarchy in 1776 than it is today, right? Right. Um, They've lost a lot of their identity since then. They've transitioned, whereas the US is still functionally the same country. Right. But there's more states. Yeah. The, the point I, I just want to make is that, you know, what we would consider democracy today is not what you know, people consider democracy in 1776. So what South Korea was in, in 1950 is different from what it is today. But of the two, um, you know, there was a, a better respect for sort of individualism than existed in the DPRK then and now. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely fair. Um, do you think that, like, with the North and South Korea conflict, wh why is it not resolved like why is there not a peace between these two countries is it just because of outside pressure or do you think that the korean peninsula refuses to just go their separate ways and agree that you know it's been half a century we're going to be separate countries because they're both claiming control over the entire thing aaron do you want to feel better do you want me to answer or i can uh definitely i want you to answer it but i want to ask one question uh when did south korea democratize was that the 70s it's like late 80s late 80s yeah i know they were um under harsh dictatorship even during the korean war so i was kind of curious about that yeah i i think it's around late 80s um so for most of the cold war it was an authoritarian state cold war was very much an ideological conflict but it wasn't ideological in the way that i think a lot of people may view it now it wasn't sort of democracy versus authoritarianism it was straight up just capitalism versus communism um and u.s yeah. would prop up capitalist dictatorships everywhere across the world south korea was one of them taiwan was another you know south vietnam most of south america yeah south vietnam as well 
it didn't matter that these countries were autocratic. Um, you know, the Shah in Iran, mm-hmm. for example, was an autocrat, but he was a capitalist, so he was our guy. Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of true. The U.S. just prioritizes relationships with anybody who benefits us economically. So Saudi Arabia or um, South American countries, and we, we will install a new regime that is friendlier to our markets, even if it's a democratically elected communist government that's worse than a fascistic capitalist government. Yeah. I think, you know, ideally the United States would love for every country on the planet to be a capitalist sort of liberal democracy, but that's not realistic, right? So there, there's sort of a tier list here of what um, kind of relationship the U.S. would have with these kinds of countries. You know, Canada, liberal democracy, capitalist, right? We get along just fine. Um, Mexico uh, has dabbled with sort of autocracy on occasion, right? Um, Not super authoritarian, but not as liberally democratic as Canada, right? But very capitalistic. Yes. Nationalized oil industries, I think, still. Um, I'm not sure. Do they? I I think that Mexico owns, has state-owned petroleum and maybe a couple of other things, but... Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, the, the, the deepest relationships that liberal democracies have are with other liberal democracies, right? right. Like, yeah. the UK and France are very close, whereas the UK and, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, a less democratic ally than Russia. UK. Well, <laughs> there are more advers- adversaries and have been for centuries, right? But yeah, you know, um, there, there are, there are I, maybe I'll just, I'll stick with the US because it's what I know. Um, the US and Saudi Arabia are allies. But we are culturally very different, and Saudi Arabia is a very authoritarian state, but we have a much deeper relationship with the United Kingdom, which is also a liberal democracy, sort of the point I want to get across here. We would prefer, I say we, as if I'm speaking for the United States government, uh, the interests of the United States are better served when more countries are liberal democracies than not. I, I think that's true of, of most countries. I think that even like from the Chinese perspective, dealing with a liberal democracy is preferable because they're more stable and countries seek stable relationships. And liberal democracy is sort of a a privileged state of being a country because you're safe. You are like far away from conflict, generally speaking, like Finland isn't, but you know, exceptions prove the rule, whatever. But liberal democracies are pretty safe, economically have a huge output, so they're valuable friends to have, you know, just from like an economic standpoint, standpoint, no matter who you are, you want to be friends with the liberal democracies. Yeah. And it's also, you know, that the liberal democracies across the planet tend to be the richest countries as well. So there's partly, you know, an economic incentive to get along with them because they have a lot of money that they could invest in your economy or uh, they could trade with you in various ways. Right. There's a, there's um, an axiom in... Well, it's not quite an axiom. It's the closest thing to a rule that exists in international relations called the democratic peace theory. The democratic peace theory is the idea that democracies generally don't go to war with each other. And that dates back, you know, about 230 years since the advent of modern democratic societies. There are very, very small and nuanced exceptions to that rule. But by and large, democracies do not go to war with each other. Um, and that has been one of the major themes in American and previously sort of British foreign policy in the 20th century and into the 21st century is this sort of spreading of democratic values of liberal democracy because it promotes peace because these countries don't go to war with each other. Whereas the same is not true for authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes will go to war with democracies. Democracies will go to war with authoritarian regimes. But authoritarian regimes will go to war with other authoritarian regimes, right? Like right. the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, both authoritarian regimes slaughtered each other. Like this, this happens all the time. Whereas, kind of reminds me of the uh, McDonald's paradox, except that was disproven when America, um, yeah, Serbia. The, the McDonald's peace theory was the, the idea that uh, two countries with McDonald's will go to war, war with each other. And that was true until 2008, I think, when Russia invaded Georgia. No, I thought it was uh, disproven when America bombed Serbia. Did Serbia have a McDonald's in, like in the 91? 90s? Uh, yeah, let me Google this. Interesting, okay. 
regardless, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's less of a, a fundamental sort of characteristic of international relations than the democratic peace theory. Yeah, I mean, the democratic peace theory has a lot more weight behind it because you can find some brand that is only present in countries that haven't gone to war with each other. Because, like, it can't be Coca-Cola. That's in every country but North Korea. And countries have gone to war with each other. So, you, you know, you find a fast food chain. But um... Yeah, kind of like how... Wasn't there a Soviet leader who wanted Coca-Cola, but uh, it was he had no bueno, in. so he got it? I can't remember who it was. Yeah, and it was... Ah, uh, I think it was Khrushchev. I think it was, and because uh, yeah, yeah, he got it. He he liked it when he visited the states that one time. But the thing was, is wasn't it that um, it couldn't be known that it was Coca Cola, so he had it made clear and packaged in vodka bottles. Right. Now I don't know if that's a urban myth. He did have. I've heard that as well, but yeah, I think that's for sure. But I I I remember him having it repackaged as a Soviet cola. Oh, see, I always thought it was uh, clear and packed in vodka bottles. That would be funnier. So I'll go with that as being true. Urban legend, <laughs> after all. Um, but what is it? Anybody who's uh, listening, don't take that to fact. Gorbachev was in a Pizza Hut commercial. So, yeah. Soviet leader. That's one of my favorite little tidbits of history. It's a good commercial. That man had a taste of, of crappy Western pizza, and the whole Soviet Union came crashing but, down. But hey, it's not crappy, okay? It's fine. It's good pizza. To listeners out there who have never had Pizza Hut, it is garbage. To listeners out there, I, I, it was founded in Wichita, Kansas. It is excellent pizza. Okay? I like I like it. <laughs> in Canada, we have a chain called Pizza Pizza, and it's absolutely garbage. We finally got a Pizza Hut in my town of, like, I think my town's population is, like, 2,500. Very low. And we finally got a Pizza Hut. Oh my God, they ruined the Pizza Pizza fucking monopoly. <laughs> That's depressing. Uh, when a Pizza Hut demolishes the pizza industry in your town. That's a sad, sad time <laughs> of reflection. We've gotten a little bit away from Asian geopolitics, but oh. uh, I don't know if you guys want to go back to that or you want to uh, just keep this free flowing free form well, conversation we, we can go back to asia no let's go back yeah um so the united states passed in a, a defense aid budget for a bunch of countries so israel was i think one of them but it's gone topsy-turvy ukraine was the big one but taiwan was another one so why don't we talk for a little bit about america's little democratic buddy in the South China Sea or East China Sea, one of the China Seas, Taiwan. Um, what, Coli, do you think is America's benefit from having a relationship with Taiwan? Because we have to have a benefit, right? That's my opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a, a country as large as the United States will have relationships with basically every country on the planet. I think the only country that might have a larger diplomatic presence is France. Um, but generally, you know, the bigger a country is, you know, they're wealthier, they can afford to have a diplomatic sort of uh, relationship with more countries. Um, I think, you know, Taiwan is culturally um, sort of caught between China and sort of Western um liberal democracy right. western with we were saying earlier includes japan yeah yes it's um it's it's westernized in a way that like an east asian state can be westernized right, right? Exactly. it's still very different from like you know europe or north america where you know people who for whom english isn't you know their primary language they know they know enough english to sort of get by right like it's it's different in japan and korea and, and taiwan right um the uh Taiwan is, is geostrategically more important to the United States than it is sort of culturally similar, if that makes sense. It's measuring two different characteristics. Um, but like Taiwan, were it ever to fall to the PRC, would represent a bigger threat to American geopolitical interests and the international order than uh, it would be like upsetting to have like a liberal democracy fall. Like I was saying earlier, um, you know, the U.S. would prefer for the world to be full of liberal democracies because then 
know, the democratic peace theory would suggest that we wouldn't have these kinds of wars with each other that we see now, today. Are you talking just about the microchips or the first island chain? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the first island chain extends beyond Taiwan. Um, but Taiwan is, is sort of the, the keystone, the linchpin of the first island chain. But um, Taiwan, geopolitically, to the United States, represents a way to contain China in that first island chain. If China ever conquers Taiwan, that first island chain is broken. American hegemony in, um, well, the U.S. isn't really a hegemon in East Asia anymore, um, but American sort of presence in East Asia will be significantly reduced, and that will have greater ramifications for the, the international order. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so it's... So when, sorry, go when, ahead. You, when you say that like Taiwan is an important ally or asset, however you want to say it, and that it curbs the expanse of China, China borders a ton of countries that the United States does not care about at all. So it borders like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, Thailand, Myanmar, India, Nepal. It, it borders all of these countries that the U.S. doesn't seemingly have a problem with their relationship with China, even though China might have a good or potentially good relationship with them, but it, it ends up being Taiwan. Is that simply a historical thing, or is it because Taiwan is particularly important, particularly liberal, whatever? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's a couple of things. One is, like I said, there's a, a cultural proximity that exists with Taiwan that doesn't necessarily exist with Central Asian states. Um, it's also important to remember that the United States is a multicultural country. It's a multi-ethnic state. There are uh, people of Han Chinese descent that live in the United States, have lived here for generations, are as American as anyone else, right? So there is a there is a cultural trade that exists um, between Taiwan and the United States that might not exist as strongly with Central Asian states just by virtue of history and distance, right? Um, the United States is also a maritime power. And it has been for about a century and a half. It's not really a land power in the way that, say, China is. So it doesn't have these interests in Central Asia in the way that Russia and China and India, for example, do. You know, they're the sort of great powers that exist on the uh, the Asian continent. Mm -hmm. uh, simply yeah. because we're not there. You know, most of them are regional. They they. They have a sphere of influence that expands away from their borders, but no more. The United States is global. Yeah. And we, we've built an international system that is built on maritime trade, on having uh, open trade, uh, trade routes, open sea lanes. And for most of sort of like the rise of, of civilization from like, uh, say, like 1400s to about the end of World War II, uh, we did not have a system that had placed the oceans and seas under sort of this banner of being international territory, right? It was very much your empire, if they could protect their trade routes with their colonies, you needed a navy, right? Right. That's not how it's operated post-World War II. Post-1945, the U.S. Navy was basically uncontested and has control of the, the commons, as it were, yeah. right? This is a, a really, really important part of understanding sort of American hegemony globally is that the U.S. does not have a formal empire in the way that Britain and France, for example, did, where they went and they conquered countries and they administered them, I, right? Yeah. Uh, the U.S. controls the commons, uh, you know, the, the international territory, like international space, uh, whether it's, it's literal space, um, the skies or international seas. The U.S. has the ability to project power in all of those places at a much greater scale than any other competitor, um, which means that it's, it has greater access to a lot of these places that border them, right? So like islands, whereas a Central Asian state like Kazakhstan is, a, is very far removed from the United States' ability to actually exert influence mm -hmm. or uh, trade. Yeah, I'll, I will say that I think that from the majority of countries' perspective, and even from like what I know of Chinese perspective on global politics, the United States controlling international trade and sort of being the police force of the open ocean and making sure that the uh, like agreements that countries come to with the international community, like 
Indonesia, allowing ships through the Strait of Malacca, or it's not as big of an issue, but Denmark, allowing countries through the Straits of Denmark or Panama, whatever. Having a single police force and having that police force be the United States is far more agreeable than having regional, continental, or like a collection of powers. Because the United States has proven for over half a century at this point that it is capable of allowing this, facilitating it, and making it beneficial for everyone. So even the Chinese who are like the most disagreeable with the United States, I am positive that they would rather have the United States fulfilling this role than splitting the role with the United States. A great example of this is exactly what's happening in the Red Sea with the Houthis right yes. now. Uh, the United States and uh, sort of a multilateral coalition that it's sort of formed, um, not quite as extensively as I think um, DOD officials had hoped, are doing the heavy lifting in sort of batting down the, the Houthis from disrupting maritime trade mm -hmm. in the Red Sea. Whereas the Chinese Navy, despite having a naval base in um, uh, Djibouti, I think it is, yep. Um, they, they barely lifted a finger, if any. Right, they don't want um, to. And this, yeah, and, you know, from their perspective, it makes perfect sense, right? Um, they are learning, they're watching in real time U.S. naval capabilities, mm -hmm. and that's going to come in handy if they ever move against Taiwan. You know, if they were out there helping uh, this international coalition deal with the Houthis, they'd be giving away their own naval capabilities to the United States, which is their primary geopolitical do you, competitor. Do you think that... And it's a very, very smart move on their part. If someone else is willing to do that work, why should you? And that's, that's, how, states, that's how states operate. You know, they're, they're seeking to maximize their own power. They seek their own interests. Um, there is no such thing as altruism in international politics, in geopolitics. No. Uh, so that, that, raises, that raises a question because you brought up, like, China invading Taiwan, do you think that that is at all possible in the near future or at all? Because personally, I think that a, a, a military action between those two countries or between China and Taiwan, however you want to frame it, I don't think that that will ever happen. I don't think that it's possible. Um, I'm not a betting man, but if I have to put money on it, I would imagine that there's going to be some kind of conventional conflict in the Taiwan Strait or around Taiwan at some point in the next 10 years, 15 years at most. I don't necessarily mean like a large scale conventional war, but even something as sort of isolated as like a couple of ships being sunk either by Taiwan or, or China or US Navy. Um, and the reason I, I, I think it's going to happen is because um, this is a really big sort of thing symbolically for uh, the Chinese Communist Party to reunify Taiwan with the mainland, as it were. And the idea that it would be economically disastrous for China and Taiwan, especially to get involved in this kind of war and the United States, for that matter, um, that's a very Western and very, very American way of viewing um, the world. Not everybody sort of has this sort of economic, economics and, and profit first oriented culture. And I think a lot of Westerners have started to learn this from the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The idea, for example, that um, the French intelligence agency um, did not think that Putin was going to invade Ukraine because they, Thought it would be economic suicide. They'd be bogged down in, um, you know, a guerrilla war for a decade, if not more. Right. Yeah, that was sort of the consensus since the fall of the Soviet yeah. Union was that it wasn't valuable or it wasn't like a a good idea for Russia to try and take back things that it had lost or what it feels like it had lost. Right. Crimea, it technically yeah. did lose because it was Russian before they handed it over to Ukraine in like the late eighties. Or something like that? Uh, I think it was 1956. Oh, it was way earlier than that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was yeah, the that first was part Khrushchev. of the Russian SSR. I thought Khrushchev gave uh, Ukraine, or gave Ukraine Crimea, did he not? Yes, it was Khrushchev. Would you consider that yeah. one of the dumbest moves by any 
leader of the 20th century besides, like, Germany invading Russia in the Second <laughs> World War, giving Crimea to Ukraine. Why the fuck would anybody do that? That's so dumb. I mean, it didn't well, matter at the time, right? Because it was all one country, but... Uh... Well, I mean, I think it was pretty dumb, but at the time it kind of... Like Cole, I said, I think it was superfluous, right? Like, it was one country. And at the time, yeah, a bunch of Russians were living there, but a bunch of Russians were living everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is a really important thing to understand about the former Soviet Union and its former sphere of influence is that you there are a lot of different ethnic groups that live across this territory, you know? Um, granted, it, it covers something like an eighth of the Earth, um, the Earth's landmass, yeah. right? So just by sheer size, it's going to have a lot of disparate groups living there. The Soviet Union being a very powerful state and having a very powerful centralized, you know, totalitarian government was able to keep a lid on all of the sort of ethnic strife that we now see unfolding, uh, what, 33 years after the fall of the Soviet Union? I mean, it was happening before the Soviet Union even collapsed, right? Uh, the Armenians and Azeris, for example, start going at it in the late 80s before the Soviet Union even dissolved. Um, so, like, the, the Soviets drawing all these weird lines in Central Asia um, in the Caucasus region, um, it, it didn't matter at the time because it was all part of one country and the, the Soviet government was able to sort of keep a lid on everything. Um, but, you know, no one, no one saw the Soviet Union collapsing the way or, or when it did. And now we're sort of, it, it's weird to sort of, uh, in hindsight, sort of ascribe blame to any one person for the mess that they made because, again, no one saw the Soviet Union collapsing the way it did yeah. or at and all. As an American, I feel very comfortable placing all of the blame on the Soviet Union. I think that they had not a good idea between the lot of them. Um, well, <laughs> I think also they purposely, sorry, I didn't, I don't mean to interrupt you there, but they purposely drew lines to cause ethnic conflicts. Yep. Right. It's like the United like, States dividing like, the Navajo between three different states. I'm, Divide and conquer kidding, is. But... A strategy as old as no, time. No, I mean, it is functionally the, a similar idea, right? Yeah, no, it, it's it's not similar. It, it's literally the same idea. Yeah. It, the British and the French did it in the Middle East. It just, you know, drew lines in the sand. They split up ethnic groups knowing that they would be at war with each other uh, instead of France and Britain. You know, it, like, we're seeing that with Israel and Palestine, right? Yeah. Yeah, and when they weren't doing that, they were draining oceans. Yes. The Aral Sea. Yeah. specifically i mean yeah that's the the soviet union is kind of they were very destructive from hindsight they work so stupidly at everything that they do I, it they had no thought put into anything yet i'm sure they put more thought into everything than anybody else on the planet and yet they they screwed everything up it's an amazing comedy of errors no, uh, like the Soviet Union on paper is a fairly good idea because Eastern Europe, which is today divided between several countries, right, is a historically and ethnically homogenous region from an outside perspective. Yet for some reason, internally, they managed to find complete, like insane reasons to fight about everything. And... The Russians, who put themselves in charge for really no reason other than, like, inertia, have awful ideas, and they mess everything up. And, like, Central Asia, they're not to blame at all. There's just not enough of them to fight back, and they get screwed over at every turn. And so Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, whatever, they got absolutely decimated by the Soviet Union, despite the fact that they have a huge potential, but the Soviet Union and, like, to a lesser extent, the Baltics and Poland got all of the attention, got all of the benefit. And I know that a Polish listener is going to be like, oh, the Polish didn't, like, benefit at all from the Soviet Union. I'm not saying that. I'm saying compared to the Central Asian countries, right? But, like, the Soviet Union just was not effective in any way at consolidating its resources and making anything work 
you know, I want to blame America, but at the same time, it, it seems like a bureaucratic nightmare and just a complete inability to function. Yeah, I'm I'm going to push back a little bit on this. I, I do mostly agree with you. Um, you know, the Soviet Union was a mess. Uh, the fact that it sort of held together for as long as it did, I think, is actually a testament to the fact that such crazy ideas did somehow manage to work, right? Like, the fact that it existed for as long as it did, nearly 70, what was it, 70 or 19, 1917 to 1991, right? Yeah, it it lasted for a while. And like we can talk about how its economy sort of started to, uh, what's the word, wither, stagnate and wither in the 70s. And then in the 80s, um, all that time, it was still the second largest economy on the planet. You know? Well, by population, it was. They weren't doing everything wrong. Like, I'm sorry? By population, it was the third largest. So they've got a lot of wiggle room. Right. But what does that say about other countries that existed at the time that were larger, right? Like, India and China are, took them decades longer to even surpass Russia. But I would say that China. You know, only 10 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, China is a much more productive and effective country than the Soviet Union was. The Soviet Union had a head start. In like 2003, I wouldn't say so. Certainly today. 2003, China's economy was still relatively small compared to what it is today. It was like maybe two or three trillion dollars uh, GDP. So it was sort of around like what the Soviet Union would have been. But China, it, um, it, or was at the end of the Cold it War. Was coming up from. Like it, it was the fastest growth of any country in history, starting in the eighties up through like twenty ten. So, so when the the Soviet Union had its like major growth spurt in the nineteen seventies or the nineteen sixties, fifties and sixties, and then it stagnated. China somehow was able to come and grow. Well, they didn't really grow during the fifties and sixties, but they were able to come out of that period and still have growth after that. But the Soviet Union wasn't able to capitalize on what they'd already built, and they sort of collapsed under their own weight. Yeah, so the, the Soviet economy and um, the Chinese economy of today, they're, they're different, but there are, there are elements of them that are, are similar. And one of them is that they were very, the Soviet Union was, and the Chinese economy is, very heavy on industry, right? Right. And building like a lot of stuff is really good short-term GDP growth, right? Breaking out of the so-called middle income trap for countries is exceedingly difficult. And the only real way of doing that is if you're not a micro state, like a hub for um, uh, like international trade, or you carve out some niche in the, the global economy, like Singapore or Ireland, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Or tax havens. Yeah. Like Ireland. If you're a big country like China or the United States or Germany um, or India or Indonesia or whatever, the way out of the middle income trap is to turn a manufacturing based economy into a uh, consumer oriented economy, right? Having your own population buy the stuff that you make is how you get growth past just the make stuff and export it way, right? Um, most of East Asia got rich by following this export oriented model, right? You had the four, uh, the four Asian tigers, um, what was those? Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore all sort of followed this export model of building stuff and selling it to more developed to, to richer countries, right? And that worked. And because they were relatively small states, uh, they were able to, to uh, uh, sort of transition into a right. more consumer-oriented economy you know, by virtue of just, just this, yeah, they were more but flexible. They were able to carve out various niches in the global economy, right? Like Taiwan, we talked earlier, semiconductors. Yeah. Even Japan has like 110 million people. They're the size of Mexico. They were a production manufacturing country that's that's what they were known for they were known for cheap but relatively decent electronics and their economy has not grown by more than like a percent since the 90s yeah so I, they they've fallen into that trap well no not not quite they're japan became a rich country before it became are old they? they're not a middle income country they are a high income country china is a middle income country yes um, they haven't grown, but they grew like gangbusters in the seventies and eighties to the point where they became a developed nation. You know, it's, we, it's important not to forget that Japan was the first country in Asia to industrialize, right? Like 
they had a relatively good base and they copied a lot of sort of American style manufacturing and industrial practices in the immediate post-war era uh, in the 1950s. And that helped a lot with building out their manufacturing base and uh, their export oriented model. And they did transition into uh, something more of a consumer oriented economy. Um, you know, in the you know, 1980s, 1990s, they were rich at that point. Um, it's not, you know, rich in the way that the United States is, but few countries are. Um, but Japan has had to deal with this. Uh, they're at the cutting edge of a, the demographic problem that so many countries are having right now, which is that you have this very, very uh, large population of old people, right, that are getting older and older, like a, a larger percentage of the population is getting older. Um, the birth rate has crashed. So the country has been uh, uh, shrinking in size, number of people in, in Japan for like the past 13 years or something. And we're seeing now that most countries across the planet are heading to that same point. Japan just got to that point a little bit quicker than everybody else. And, you know, having a natural population growth is a great way to grow your economy. So, yeah, their economy has been largely stagnant for about three decades. But it's because primarily they've had to deal with this problem where they have fewer and fewer people in their most productive and highest spending years, which are, you know, your, your 30s and your 40s and your 50s when you're making money and you're spending it on expensive things like childcare, on your, ch your children's education, on housing, on uh, you know, consumer products. And they're not necessarily very open to immigration too, which is right. what we see a lot of other uh, you know, high income countries, as you say. The United States is just below replacement level in terms of population. Like women here have less than two children per woman. And now, it's slightly less, but the the number of immigration puts us just above replacement, which is two people per woman, basically, or one person per person, however you want to measure it. Usually it's people per woman, but... Yeah, that's... So that's... Yeah, it's... Go ahead. Oh, no, I was I was agreeing. Yeah, it's 1.2, right? Well, and I mean... 2.1 is at, replacement rate. Or, yeah, 2.1. Sorry, I mixed my numbers up there. Um, well, even, you know, I'm from Canada, right? So I know the whole point of having a bunch of immigration is not only to sustain the economy, but at this point, you also have to sustain the pension, right? So basically, like the problem we're having in Canada right now is I'm sure you've read articles is that we're having unhinged levels of Im immigration. Like I think our population is increasing at like 3% every year. And everybody says, yeah, you know, oh, it's uh, to keep corporate interests happy and keep house, you know, prices high because basically Canada's economy has given up on itself. We rely solely on the service industry and we rely on housing. If the service industry and housing goes down, Canada goes down. So we're, we have this scam going right now where basically we invite like, Oh, geez, 600,000 uh, students coming here on visas, and none of them actually get their educations. All they do is they work at Uber, Tim Hortons, you know, Subway. And this is good because it's pumping new money into our economy. Now, it's not necessarily good money because it's not, you know, we have doctor shortages, how, you know, the housing crisis. Well, money that goes to those countries just gets funneled into the United States. It's gone. Yeah, but like what I'm saying is, sorry, I got on a little tangent there. The whole point of this is everybody's saying, oh, it's to keep the house prices high and it's to keep wages low. If we get all these temporary foreign workers here, they're going to take up all the jobs that are minimum wage. So there's no more competition. But But the real... Sorry, the real purpose behind this, it's, yeah, it's to keep house prices high and minimum wage low. But the real purpose behind this is like we were talking about with South Asia and specifically Korea and Japan is Canadians don't have any babies. And we have so many old people and they dominate the votes. So we need all these new workers to basically funnel money into the Canadian pension plan. Yeah, that's because our we don't have enough young people to realistically support the old people. 
But unlike Japan and South Korea, we do have open immigration. So it's a Band-Aid fix, but it's also causing problems with, like I said, housing and wage stagnation. That's a, a really good point that you brought up about um, in democratic states, old people tend to have the overwhelming majority of power. A major problem with that is that, you know, most voters vote in their own self-interest. You shouldn't expect anything more from humanity, is my opinion. No. I, I, yes, I, I agree. You know, it's um, individually, we're, we're very selfish. Um, the, the problem is that democratic states, um, one, they're already slow to act just because by virtue of having to have, you know, plebiscites on uh, either, you know, issues themselves through direct referendum, they don't move as quickly as authoritarian states. Um, they're more deliberative, which can be good or bad, right? Like every system of government has its strengths and its weaknesses. The major weakness of democracies is that they're slow to act. Um, this is a problem that, you know, we do have a lot of foresight on, like we're seeing what's happening with Japan. There has been no great solution to this other than sort of just, um, you know, greater immigration to sort of keep the population growing. Um, but, you know, so long as people vote in their own self-interest, and don't think about like the long-term health of their society, of their, their country, um, you have sort of gerontocracies where, you know, these democratic states serve the interests of people who have accumulated a lot of capital and by virtue, a lot of political power, right? Um, so the issues that dominate, you know, uh, what voters care about tend to be things that old people care about, you know? They don't necessarily care about housing prices if they already have, the, uh, have a house, right? You know, beyond, you know, they want their, the, the, the value of their, their property to go up, right? That is at odds with what young people want. You know, people who are trying to start a family are going to be less likely to have children if they can't afford a home of their own, right? But again, that's at odds with what old people uh, uh, generally want, you know? So it's, uh, these are two groups that are sort of looking past each other. It's just, if, you know, you want your country, um, if you want sort of, you know, your pension, uh, plan or whatever to, to sort of be there you know, for you when you need it, you need to have a young, a large, young, productive workforce to prop that up. And, you know, it, we keep making life more and more expensive um, the earlier you are in your, in your life, right? It takes a long time for somebody to even become a productive worker in the first place, right? This is one of those fundamental shifts that came about um, due to do industrialization. You know, people don't really become productive workers until they're, you know, well into adulthood, by and large, right? Pre-industrial area, you know, for the 10,000 years that we were a primarily agricultural species, children could start working on the farms and be productive at like five years old, right? There was some marginal return on value from having a child um, pretty quickly. That's not true anymore. Like children are generally a black hole for a, a normal family's finances. Uh, in most countries. Uh, so it, it you don't get a return on your investment, as it were, to use sort of very simplistic language, uh, until they're like well into their 20s or 30s. And the most expensive parts of life, aside from like end of, end of life care, are, you know, like buying a home and raising a child. And, you know, wages for young people in their 20s and 30s are just lower because they don't have ex the experience that older workers have, right? They're, they're not as, as productive in, in that manner, right? It's, they have less uh, bargaining power, less negotiating power with their employers. Uh, so we have this very expensive front-loaded um, dynamic in most countries across, across the planet. And it's, we're reaching a breaking point where it just, it's not sustainable. So people are just not having as many children as maybe they would like. I, I see this as an interesting segue into a, a question that I would like to ask of both of you. And that is, when, when you're looking at this problem, and I think that we all agree that it is a problem, that there, there are fewer younger people being less productive, perhaps, uh, as a group, not per capita, but we have this issue where we have a large aging population, we're decreasing in, in new workers, so do you see that the advantage could be shifting to a country that already has the infrastructure in place to nationalize profits for certain industries. So the United States, in my opinion, a lot of 
wealth or productive capital is lost in the forms of profits or shares of companies. Whereas in a country like China, you see nationalized industries being able to pay into these pensions. So, like, I'll admit China has a worse problem with this, like, aging population thing, but perhaps they have a better infrastructure in place to mitigate those problems than the United States or England or uh, normal Western democracies. Well, honestly, I think capitalism kind of gets, the in, you know, in the way of that, and... I think I have a valuable standpoint here as somebody from Canada, because like I said earlier, when it comes to the declining birth rate and the need to continue to fund our growing number of pensioners, Canada is the canary in the coal mine. Because like I said, we do have an unreasonable level of immigration. And I don't mean this as a xenophobe or anything, but like when you have a housing crisis and a population of 38 million, letting in 1.2 million people every year, that's not sustainable. Well, let me just interject. That's not just sort of emblematic of the problem I was describing. That's good for the old people that live in Canada because you have more young workers coming in that are basically propping up their pensions, right? It's not good for the young people who now can't afford a house because there's greater competition and not enough supply, right? So it's you have this generational... Um, uh, divergence in economic no, that's interests. That's definitely true. You you've got the the uh what is it? The people who own most of the wealth, the people who hoard most of it. I I mean however you want to say it, I'd say hoard. And then you've got the people who are producing wealth. Right? In the United States we have a problem of people not having savings accounts, people not having enough money to buy homes. In Canada it's even worse. But uh in the United States you know, millennials, whatever, we don't have enough money in order to buy the assets that will appreciate over time. And so we are simply producing value without having any long-term security. And so it's beneficial for the the older generations, like you said, Coli, but it's not good for the new generation. So what, what are you going to do? Eventually, the millennials, whoever, will be in charge but are is all of their wealth? Yeah, it, it'll be too late by that point. Yeah, it, it's it'll be too late. Um, I think millennials and and probably um, Gen Z after us are more of a they're going to live through a transition a transitory period um, where our economic model is going to have to sort of change just by even if we don't want it to, it's going to have to because the demographics that sort of govern human civilization are changing, you know, and and that's a force of nature, right? Like you can't just like pretend it's not happening. It's happening. Right. Um, And I think, you know, baby boomers and the silent generation and uh, generation X, they'll die off. And, you know, much of their, all of their assets are going to have to sort of go down to next of kin. Um, They'll get gobbled up by millennials and Gen Z, but much later in life than would be advantageous for those generations, right? It's right, and it'll all be spent on avocado toast and Taylor Swift tickets. <laughs> if Taylor Swift is still selling out concerts in like thirty years, I'll be impressed. We like, had to get her. true. We had to get Trudeau to literally Not boycott her to come here. She wouldn't <laughs> even visit Canada. Toronto's like 30-minute flight. Trudeau had to make an she appeal. She wouldn't even go there for a concert. That's so sad. Yeah. She already flies between Not Nashville even on and her own Kansas plane. City like nope. five times Crazy. a day. Well, no, I think she... <laughs> No, she, re... she rebooked. Uh, she has six. She has six ticket, uh, six not six tickets. She has six shows in Toronto. My mom is a big, big sweet. Oh no! And my mom makes really good money, and she can't even get a ticket. That's crazy. Yeah, like she, she I mean, she flies like across the street. So that's wild that she had to be convinced to go to Toronto. Canada is not what it once was. It's becoming more and more like sir. 
<laughs> it was like America Junior. Yeah. Now it's more like Serbia. <laughs> I, I my my characterization of Canada has always just been like Diet America, you know. Um, I I joke about this, and uh, I'm sure Canadians are going to find it offensive, but. I can't think of another country whose identity is built uh, so strongly on the idea of not being another country. Obviously, that's not everything about Canada, but there's a very big sort of like uh, sense of like, we have to explain that we're not American, you know? I have a comic about that. Oh, do you really? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to link you it. Please do. I think the only country that comes close is Scotland as not being England or the UK, whichever, which, like, it is the UK. I see, even then, I feel like, but but Scotland has, like, a much longer history of being an independent polity. Than, well, not if uh, you count the first peoples Canada, or whatever you know? like the, native I Canadians don't know. I, I feel like that's not called. Well, we're not, because yeah. you know, modern Canada isn't an indigenous society anymore, you know? Modern Canada is a it's a settler state in the way, you know, the United States and Australia and basically most of the Americas, all of the Americas really are, you know, settler state is sort of probably a uh, too um, yeah. generous I mean, of a term. You know, we, these I, lands were conquered a by very you know, disturbing and fact colonists. that I unfortunately think of a lot of times. And that is that the native Taino people of Puerto Rico, they were like the people there before um, Columbus arrived right? They integrated, not integrated, but so the Spanish position was that the Spanish men, conquistadors, could take Taino women as wives, and anybody that wasn't a Taino woman taken as a wife was a slave or executed. And so today, if you look at the genetics, only the X chromosome of the Taino people survive. The Y chromosome, or the male chromosome, of the Taino people is extinct. Because the only surviving descendants of the Taino are from the women who were taken as second wives or concubines of the Spanish settlers. That is disturbing. I hate that fact. We didn't really expand much on Taiwan. Yeah, we can talk about Taiwan. The answer, if we, if we want to go back to that, I'm I'm happy to talk about Taiwan. I have been there. I love Taiwan. It's a wonderful place. You know, it's a beautiful island, beautiful country, whatever you want to call it. But I I I think that in the United States, in the West, its importance is overblown. And I've been in Taiwan and met people who are in the army or the navy, whatever. And, you know, they talk about being in the military of Taiwan and working for island or national defense. But then you go to mainland China and you talk to people about it and they just call it like in Chinese that you say the name of a province and then you say Zhou. And that means province because China has provinces, not states. And they just call Taiwan, Taiwan state. And you ask them about it and they're like, oh yeah, I went there on vacation a couple of years ago. Like, it's just part of China to the average Chinese person. There's no hostility towards it. If you go to Taiwan, there's tons of mainland Chinese around. I, I cannot fathom a military conflict between Taiwan and mainland China. I simply cannot. I think that Taiwan is too valuable I think that they're too culturally meshed, and I think that they're too peaceful. Like, both Taiwan and China are pretty peaceful countries. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the problem I have here is that when you say it's valuable, again, I think you're, you're coming at it from the Western perspective, where the destruction anticipated sort of acts as as a deterrence from sort of chaotic right. action. Yeah. And you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, that was sort of the interpretation that um some European intelligence agencies had about Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine 
and that turned out not to be the case. It's it's not up to the Chinese people or the Taiwanese people or you know Americans or the Japanese what happens over Taiwan. It's up to effectively one man, and that's Xi Jinping. You know, it's the status quo works for the United States, for Taiwan, for Japan, right? The status quo, if someone wants to change it, it has to be China because it doesn't work for them. They would prefer Taiwan to no longer be this breakaway state. Um, they want to reunify it. I say they, I'm, I'm you know, referring to the, 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 the elements within the, the Chinese Communist Party that would right, that the, the, happen, right? I forget what they're called, um, but sort of yeah. reunified the, like the country. Of yes, them. it's um, so it's it's not up to the Chinese people. It's not up to the Taiwanese people. You know, it's one man can make the decision in the same way that Vladimir Putin made the decision to invade Ukraine. It wasn't up to the Russian people. Certainly wasn't up to the Ukrainian people. Um, the idea that you know conspiratorial right wing. Uh, I guess people in, in Western Europe, United States, Canada sort of blamed the U.S. for sort of instigating is a bunch of bullshit. Um, and, you know, we want to imagine that states act rationally, but people are not rational, right? People are not rational actors. They're capable of acting rationally. But would Russia be in a better state today had it never invaded Ukraine? Yeah, they would have more of their own citizens alive. They would be more economically productive. Uh, but Vladimir Putin wanted to conquer territory. He doesn't care about how many lives uh, it costs to conquer Ukraine. That's what he wants, whether it's rational or irrational. You know? and, and so applying rationality to um, these potential scenarios that could be sparked by irrationality, I think, is, is a naive uh, sort of position to have. You know, I, I do think that there will be something happen between the United States and China uh, or China and, and Taiwan in the Taiwan Strait vis-a-vis Taiwan's sort of uh, status in the international system. Um, I'm less convinced that it'll come to full out conventional war between the US and China, uh, because I think one, Ukraine importantly serves as a deterrence to you know, a would-be Chinese aggression. Um, and the US is also taking it very seriously by bolstering its alliances with neighboring states like the Philippines, Taiwan itself, Japan, South Korea, and it's sort of building the defenses that it views as necessary to deter Chinese aggression against Taiwan in the first place. So the way that I think about it is, like, I agree that China has a very different perspective of what Taiwan means, but from everything that they put forward to their own people, right, Taiwan is a part of China. It's a state or a special administrative region, however you want to say it. So, like, the, there's this element of political capital that you have to consider, and I think that China wins on that regard. On the economic side, I think that China also wins because chi- Taiwan is a national leader or an, a, a global leader in technological innovation. And then on a interpersonal, like a, a like a relational uh, level, Taiwan does not stick that far out of the pack from Ta- from Hong Kong, Macau, Tibet, and Xinjiang province. They're not that much more independent. They're not that much more different from China, right? So. I think from, like, looking at it from Xi Jinping's perspective, he is not a warmonger. He's not ever declared a war. He's not ever engaged China in any sort of major conflict. You could consider the police actions in in Hong Kong is that. And if you do, then, yeah, that could extend to Taiwan. But that's such a, like, huge leap in, like, scale that I don't think that it's, like, worth considering. But Taiwan is a a very interesting case in that it is fully functional. It's a very productive, democratically robust, happy island that there's, like, no 
justification that you could have to improve it. Even from the Chinese perspective, it is viewed as being like a nice place to live. Whereas Ukraine can be seen as oppressing Chinese or as oppressing Russian citizens or not letting them do something. I cannot see the justification for China doing anything in Taiwan because they are Han Chinese. It's not like they can say, oh, they're oppressing Chinese people. No. Oh, they're giving gay marriage. Okay, China doesn't really care. Like, it's not a big deal for Xi Jinping or the Chinese government. Like, there's not anything that Taiwan does that China is upset about enough in order to go to war. And China, yeah. I think it comes down to pride. It's, yeah, I agree with Aaron. I think pride is, is a big thing here. Um, like, let's, let's not pretend that world leaders don't have egos, right? You do not get to that level in politics without having an absolutely colossal... Yeah, and Xi Jinping has one of the biggest. Every single leader of every single state on the planet. Yes. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing earlier. You said that um, Taiwan was not that much more independent than a place like Hong Kong or Tibet or whatever. I think this is fundamentally wrong. Taiwan is, by all accounts, a de facto independent state. Um, it is it's not an integral part of China, and it never has both the PRC. It never has. From their part perspective, of the PRC. it is. Um, it it pays money, but they don't they don't exert any control over it. Like you can make a claim on territory and have historical ties, but if you don't govern it, it's not your it's not part of right, your state. Right, but China has enough. Taiwan is is very much an independent involvement with Taiwan. They're their largest trade partner. They have the biggest economic ties. The most number of people who immigrate or even travel to Taiwan are Chinese. It is, like, the the biggest influence of mainland China is in Taiwan, of any country. This is, same thing is true of the United States and Canada, but they're separate countries. I'm talking about, like, politically here. Like, Taiwan is a de facto independent state. Um, it's recognized by like what two or three dozen countries. It used to be recognized um, almost globally, um, you know, until the Chinese Civil War uh, sort of ended with the, the yeah, like victory. a decade long. But no, I mean, like Taiwan is is straight up like a de facto independent state. Um, like the, the sort of closeness, the proximity of Chinese culture and uh, uh, economic activity is irrelevant to its political status. Uh, but this is just me nitpicking. Um, the greater point I want to make here is that Taiwan is not just an island that's important to mainland China for whatever reason. It's important to the United States for different reasons, right? So like we have perhaps these two states, these two civilizations viewing the same island in different ways. And it serves their interests in different ways. Um, I think in a, a very broader sense, Taiwan represents the start of what the next international system looks like, right? It's does the world become multipolar or does it remain sort of largely under American? And hegemony? Taiwan represents American and hegemony. Taiwan is, is yes. Taiwan falls to uh, the People's Republic of China, then we're, we're back to a multipolar international system. The U.S. is no longer sort of this hyper power that uh, has been, a, you know, a, a power that's been eroding in relative power to other states for the past 30 years, um, but has largely been able to keep this international system, global international system, together. That's very dangerous, and the U.S. is interested in maintaining its sort of its position at the top of the international system, not just because it serves its own interests, like it's lucrative, don't get me wrong, to be sort of the heart of an empire, as it were, even if it's an informal one. Um, but even more importantly, uh, a unipolar international system is inherently more stable than a multipolar one. And China sort of conquering Taiwan would immediately mean that we're now in a multipolar era. The last time we were in a multipolar era was 1939. Well, well 1940. My, my position isn't that Taiwan is necessarily going to be consolidated into China's position. It's just that it can exist as it is without harming 
what China views as its position on the world stage. Like, of course, China wants Taiwan to be aligned with itself. But it can be written off as a breakaway province that has, you know, more control or is more aligned with the West because China doesn't have that many allies. They don't have that many massive, like, friends like the United States has that will back them no matter what. I don't think that they have any besides maybe North Korea. China's position on the world stage is not built around indestructible alliances like the United States is. They don't have that level of, I, I don't know, confidence or maybe like lack of confidence that they need sworn loyalty. They are simply there as an economic or like, like light political push for a lot of countries. They're not invading anybody. They're not making mutual defense treaties. They're, they're, I, I don't see them doing anything about Taiwan because that's just not what they're trying to get out of their place in the international arena. But China has historically viewed itself as, you know, basically the Titan in East Asia, in its region. Um, you know, going back to you know, old Chinese dynasties, this isn't a modern thing. Right, like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, Korean and Japanese civilization are effectively offshoots of ancient sort of yeah, Chinese civilizations. Um, these are this is a country that calls itself the Middle Kingdom, right? It's um, it's a country that is very, particularly under you know the leadership of the Communist Party, deeply sort of embarrassed by the century of humiliation, where it was sort of uh, weak and picked picked apart by European powers to various degrees um, and subservient to Western and European interests for about a century. This is a country that is, uh, has newfound wealth and power and is starting to flex it. Uh, the idea that, rather, the, um, you know, the fact that it hasn't really started wars, it's not a warmongering nation, does not preclude it from becoming one. Uh, and there are enough signs in Chinese foreign policy uh, and particularly its military buildup over the past decade and a half, two decades, that show it is interested in becoming more aggressive, right? Like you, you see sort of the maritime disputes that it has in the South China Sea with the Philippines, with Vietnam, with Mal um, uh, sorry, with like Brunei or whatever. Um, yeah, Sri Lanka. You know, like they're straight up like, using, um, uh, you know, their Coast Guard cutters and ramming Filipino ships, right? They're doing everything short of actual kinetic conflict to sort of enforce their um, uh, their influence, right? And that's something that the United States did when it was an ascending power. It's something that Germany did. It's something that Britain and France did at all, you know, at various points in power or various points in history. Japan did it too when it was a rising power in, uh, in East Asia. This is sort of how it starts, right? Like countries don't just become aggressive out of nowhere. Um, there, there's a buildup. We, we can see it, you know, like China has the largest Navy by number of ships in the world now. Um, oh, yeah, but that's they're like building. They are building the type how many ships that they have that are like tugboats. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's the, the missile boats are much smaller in tonnage. The, the Chinese Navy is smaller in tonnage than the American Navy, about a third the size in tonnage. But they are building exactly the kinds of ships that they would need to launch an amphibious invasion of Taiwan. And that's one of the things I think that gives me pause about saying that China, despite their, their record of generally not starting wars, means that they won't start one over Taiwan. And I, I generally agree with you with the idea that like they're not necessarily opposed to um, a degree of Taiwanese autonomy so long as it's subservient to Beijing, um, as we kind of see with Hong Kong. but. You know, the, I don't even the independence think that, that Hong, Hong Kong had has, has sort of withered, and I would expect the same thing to happen in uh, a Taiwan that is sort of incorporated into to China. Yeah, I, I don't even think that they have to be subservient, because I think that China sees the value in the, the way that Taiwan functions. They give China a, an, like access to the international market. That's something that Hong Kong had and still has now 
like with HSBC and all of these international finance institutions, China didn't really touch those. And Taiwan has this like interesting position as being a really important country for the international market. They have great relationships with other countries. They are a ambassador for Chinese culture, which is something that China is really like playing into in the last few years, um, like in the United States and more importantly around the world, like in Africa and Latin America. Uh, Taiwan is pretty important in that regard. Um, I I think that, yeah, China is, like, building up... You, you say that their, their navy is what you would need in order to invade Taiwan, but it's also the navy that you would need in order to defend China. It's the same navy. And it's not. No, there, there's, no that, that's, that's, that's not... That's straight up not right. Like, I, I don't want to be, like, super confrontational here, but things like aircraft carriers and amphibious assault ships are for expeditionary purposes. They're not for defensive purposes, that, right? They this are important one for of the, China. When in history, all of their infrastructure to cross their major rivers and to move between ports has been destroyed. That's the first tactic in the Opium Wars and the invasion of Japan on China. Having this sort of military is exactly the kind of military that China would have needed in the past in order to defend itself. No, you don't need an aircraft carrier to defend littoral parts of your coast. But they only have two aircraft carriers. Uh, they very nearly have a third. They're building a fourth. It's well, thought that they want to build five or six. But that's well, not just aircraft just carriers. It's also Soviet ones that they bought. It's also um, the amphibious assault ships, which are the thing that you would – that would be like the, the main thing that you would want in an amphibious invasion are you know, things like you know, the, the U.S. version would be like the America class. <laughs> Um, or the Wasp class. Right. These are, the, the People's these are Liberation designed, these... Army gets a lot more money than the People's Liberation Navy, still. So, if you... Oh, well, like yeah. If... I mean, it's... But that's been changing. Like, we're, we're seeing the largest uh, peacetime uh, naval buildup in history. Like, this, this is a larger naval buildup than uh, uh, Germany pre-World War I, uh, Japan in the interwar years. It's remarkable. It's, you know, like, you don't need aircraft carriers when you're primarily a land power, you know? China doesn't really have overseas interests in the way that the United States does, for example, right? The U.S., Britain, and France have historically been expeditionary powers. They built these very powerful navies in order to uh, sort of project power on completely different parts of the globe, right? Um, China has never really needed that because its interests were always in its immediate region, whether it was physically on, you know, the Asian continent bordering China itself, or across a very, very, very small uh, body of water. Now, and the Taiwan Strait is only about, what, 90 miles across? But that's still large enough to warrant, you know, having a large uh, expeditionary navy in order to invade. It's exactly what you would need. You know, if you were interested primarily in coastal defense, you would build something like what the Soviet Navy had, which was more, you know, destroyers and uh, submarines and frigates, and less of like these massive capital ships like aircraft carriers and amphibious assault ships that are designed to project power in other parts of the world for you know long sustained naval operations. But China needs that for national defense as well. Is my point is there's not really any better option if they want to spend on the navy than spending on amphibious assault ships and the odd aircraft carrier, whatever that they're doing, that I think is more of like a, a political show, right? Because an aircraft carrier is not useful in an invasion of Taiwan either, if we're being honest. Because the if the United States Navy is involved, an aircraft carrier isn't lasting 10 minutes. It's a huge target. It has no value. Any aircraft that China would use in that conflict can be launched from the mainland. So it's not oh, like uh, yeah, I I don't agree, but I mean that that's my point is that they don't necessarily need aircraft carriers to take Taiwan, but aircraft carriers are absolutely something used for expeditionary purposes, right? This yes, is, it's 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 indicative of a desire for China to flex its muscles in areas that are even more far flung than Taiwan. No, but I but think the that rest that is... the rest of what they're building is is also absolutely necessary for uh you know a war over Taiwan. 
and an aircraft carrier would still be useful in a in a hot war over Taiwan. Yeah, like I I do agree with you. I think that aircraft carriers, both American and Chinese, uh, are sitting ducks in an, in a in a hot war between those two powers. Um, but they they still represent um, you know uh, an ability to move air assets elsewhere. You know you know an a, an air base on land is a stationary target. Yeah, um, that's you know, very a true. Mobile target is a lot harder to hit, especially when you know they're defended by uh, air defense from destroyers and, and frigates, um, and then submarines as well. You know, protecting uh, the whole carrier group. Yeah, I, I'm sure that anything within 20 miles of the mainland Chinese coastline is protected by anti-aircraft fire and defensive aircraft formation. So you could have an aircraft carrier there, no problem. But th that's my point. Is like you know yeah. you don't you don't need aircraft carriers to defend China's coast because they have the mainland. You know, like you can't yeah. you can't invade China. No one no one ha like, no one has the manpower to invade China. Not like not even India. How are you going to move that many people? You know, across the Himalayas. You know, it's, China is basically impervious to sort of uh, land invasion. Right. No, so I definitely this, agree this, with you. It's just that I, I disagree that it's useful for any sort of confrontation with Taiwan. I think that it is a threat against the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam about the South China Sea. I, I think that if they were to go and fight about Taiwan, that the aircraft carriers would be pointless. I, I, that's, that's my opinion, that they're trying to, well, to I mean, imagine fight these South, Asia, South Asian countries. It is a contingency in the case of American involvement. Right, because American carriers, if they get involved, they're going to be off of the east coast of Taiwan. They're not going to be in the Taiwan Strait. You know, they would be sunk immediately in the Taiwan Strait. Right. Um, yeah. So, even when you're, it's not even that far out, but when you're off the east coast of Taiwan, that's far enough away from the Chinese mainland where not the entirety of China's missile anti-ship missile arsenal would be able to hit those carriers. Right. right. And they're fighting. So having having, having a escort. mobile airfield, you know, uh, like the Liaoning or the Shandong or the Fujian their newest carrier, um, those can hunt other carriers, right? Like we've seen carrier battles in World War II. They, they were important. Um, you know, it's a way, again, to project power beyond, you know, where your physical landmass, where your, your actual bases are, you know, on physical yeah. land, territory. I, um, and I that will be that... necessary, you know? Like if you want to disrupt American shipping from Guam or Hawaii to... Uh, you know, two American carrier groups off the east coast of Taiwan, you might want to be able to project power conventionally with an aircraft carrier uh, battle group, aircraft carrier group, strike group, whatever the terminology is. Um, I, you know, I do not the think that there is any possibility that, the, that China would enter into a conflict with the United States. That is so one-sided in the favor of the United States. I cannot... I don't agree that it's that possibly but... imagine it, it's completely one-sided except on I, land I which china cannot make the united states fight on land in the air and the water china cannot compete period it's not like i don't see how that's a question the the problem is that the u.s has global commitments right so we might have a larger navy and tonnage but it's spread out across across the globe china's entire navy is basically in the south and east china seas um, they can commit more of their assets to a war over Taiwan than we conceivably could. You know, I no, would argue that if commit, I were an American president, we if I were an American friendly. president, if I were an American president, and it came to a, like a hot war over Taiwan, you're playing for keeps at that point. You might as well send like every every ship you have available because the only realistic competitor the United States has in this century is China. If you lose that war over Taiwan, we're back to a multipolar world. It's much less stable. You're going to get much more nuclear proliferation because the American security guarantee isn't, you know, a sure thing anymore. If they can't defend something like Taiwan, um, it's bad. Um, if you win uh, a hot war over Taiwan, China's basically out of the game for a decade or two. So, yeah. See, but that, I don't. I don't see an I American don't... president committing that many assets to, to a war over Taiwan. I can it's absolutely risky. see an American president and NATO, like, I, even though Taiwan's not NATO, I mean, NATO would, like, form around the United States, because the United States, plus Australia, plus the United Kingdom, is undefeatable. 
China cannot possibly hope to, I think, even get a foothold in Taiwan. They, they don't have the access via land that they did in Korea that gave them the advantage. They simply cannot take that over. Yeah, maybe they could take out the U.S. Pacific Fleet, the 11th Carrier Division, whatever it is that's in the Strait of Taiwan and around there. But if the United States just had four weeks, three weeks, in order to consolidate the Atlantic and the British and the Australian Navy, there's no way that, the United, that, that China could defend itself with even a complete control over Taiwan. There's no way. So I don't see why they would. The various like academic institutions, like the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, pretty famous, um, they famously did a series of, I think, 24 or 23 war game scenarios about a potential Taiwan contingency. And in 23 of, in all but one of those contingencies, the U.S. was able to win. Or rather, like, Taiwan was able to sort of maintain independence, is a better way of putting it. The only scenario that they war game where China was able to win was in the complete absence of American intervention. Um, now, obviously, you know, war games are one thing, war is an entirely different one, but it's really the only way of, you know, imagining what you could, what a war might look like, right? It's, right, but I don't think that it's possible for there to be an, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan that is free of American intervention. I, I see, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't want to say it's an absolute thing, you know, I think, um, I think it's Charles de Gaulle has this pretty famous quote where, um, you know, the United States didn't want France to develop an independent nuclear capacity. Um, they tried to reassure them that, you know, you fall under our nuclear umbrella. We'll take care of you. Don't worry. Um, and de Gaulle, I think, uh, told or asked uh, JFK, would you can, you, can you sit here and honestly tell me that you would, you would trade uh, Washington, D.C. or New York for Paris, right? Um, it's it's easy to talk about these things in hypotheticals, but when you're an American president and you are tasked with potentially putting Americans in harm's way for another country, there are a lot of sort of domestic politics that can complicate that. We've seen a greater strain of isolationism in the Republican Party over the past 10 years since Trump has sort of uh, controlled the party to the, the degree that he has, which is like completely at odds with what Republicans have been like since, you know, 1945. They've been the incredibly interventionist. flip-flop every 30 years. It's fine. Yeah. So it, it, there's a strain of isolationism um, that exists and is growing in, in American politics. I think it, it's played a huge role in the delay over aid to Ukraine. That was only just passed last week. Um, and I'm, I'm not convinced that the United States would absolutely – go to war over Taiwan if, if China moved against it. I would say I'm like 90-10 that we would, but there's enough consternation in American politics about foreign involvement and wars that involve America that makes me hesitant to say that it would be absolutely ironclad. I think the only country that I can absolutely guarantee that we would protect if push comes to shove is Canada. Australia. Hey. Purely, purely, purely selfishly because it's right goddamn there. You know, if any foreign power got a foothold in Canada, that is a direct threat to the United States, um, you know, home territory. Even a country like Britain. Canada is great because it's like having a 51st state with no rights. <laughs> it, no, it's true. Um, like, it, it is a, a genuinely, like, good thing for the United States to be able to have, like, these allies that don't really get in the way of American sort of warmongering and imperialist yeah. ambitions, you know, yeah. to put it lightly, um, no, you're, and are sort of like content to just like go along with it and like you know like, acquiesce to what the America what the Americans want to do globally. Greenland sharks are the longest lived sharks. They're the second largest species of sharks, and there is a species of parasitic fish that live and their only function in life is to latch onto the eye sockets of a Greenland shark and 
just sit there drinking blood for their entire life. But Greenland sharks live in the dark. They can't see anything anyway. So they barely notice that they have these parasitic leeches just sucking away their vision. And the leeches live a happy life. The Greenland sharks are no worse off for it. That is Canada's relationship with the United States. We'd be doing the same shit. We don't need to see where we're going. We're massive. We just do what we want. It doesn't matter. And we get these little Canadian leeches in our eye sockets. They see the horror of what we're, like, imposing on the world. But, you know, they're fine because they're, they're drinking our blood. It's okay. They're our little buddies. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to know that you think of me as a fucking leech. <laughs> Who sucks on your eye socket, licking out your eye goo? Yeah, I mean, it's my sustenance. <laughs> I, I, think I have I a question, it. and yeah, it's hypothetical. It. Okay, so you said that Canada was the only country the United States would defend. It's the only one that I'm willing to say 100 percent we would. Like yeah, Britain is like 99.9 percent, Australia like 99.8. Canada is 100 Hypo- because it's it's you're attached to us, you know. Okay, hypothetically. Say that there was a Chinese-backed strike group, mostly manned by Cubans and Venezuelans, and they took over Yucatan. And at the same time, the Russians conquered Nunavut. What one would the Americans prioritize? We would invade keep in Iraq. Mind, um, keep in mind, invading... So they have a foothold in Nunavut, and they have a foothold in the Yucatan. There's a lot of fucking very sorry. I don't mean to swear so much. No, there's a there's a lot of uh, hot you know hostile space between Nunavut and Canada or and the U.S. border, and also Yucatan and the U.S. border at Texas. So, what one do you think the Americans would prioritize? Would they prioritize the Chinese Venezuelans invading Yucatan, or would they prioritize getting the Russians out of Nunavut? That's an interesting question. The, the problem with, like, hypotheticals like this is that they're so wild, it's, like, hard to Cause imagine. Because realistically... Like, I don't, like, I, I, I can't imagine the DoD even does contingency planning for things like this, you know? Like, it's so outside the realm of possibility, it's kind of hard to suspend disbelief, but... Realistically, I'm, I'm confident I feel like we they would protect Yucatan Peninsula. And then I was going to say... None of it. Because you can just let the Russians die in Nunavut. There's nothing there. Yeah. I mean, worst case yeah, scenario. Harder to resupply. Yeah. Harsher, harsher climate. To to answer it, yeah, I mean, I think that the Yucatan is geographically more important. Um, it represents a greater threat to American interests of a hostile power. Um, has a foothold in the Gulf of Mexico, you know. Well, and also realistically, like people live in Yucatan. Whereas yeah. if the Russians took over Nunavut, it would just be a bunch of Russians essentially sitting on the moon. Yeah, it's uh, an interesting hypothetical, but it's one of those that's sort of like, it's so hard to suspend this belief. It's, so, it's such a wild thing to entertain, you know? Yeah, because I know everybody's like, oh, well, the Russians, they'll attack through Canada. And it's like, how? Yeah. How are they but... going to get there? Yeah. Like yeah how much they're... trouble they're going, you know, to get like 20 miles into Ukraine. Yeah. We could conquer half of Canada before Canada even notices. Yeah. Oh, the U.S. will notice before, right? Like, that's what happened with the, the Chinese spy balloon, right? The uh, U.S. was tracking and saw it entered Canada, Canadian airspace before Canada did, something like that. Well, yeah. I mean, we have, like... Well, we have NORAD, I think We have, so. like, what, 12 jets? Yeah. But, I remember yeah. Stephen Harper trying to put forward this, like, oh, jeez. Uh, the numbers are definitely going to be wrong. It was like some like sixty five billion dollar deal to get your second hand like hand me down Tom Cruise Top Gun nineteen eighty five when uh, I almost said Winnipeg Jets. Basically, where I'm going with this is our air force is laughable. That's why I make all these comics about. Um, I have this one about um, when we called off the airstrikes on ISIS. And it's Canada calling some air general, and he's like, "The air strikes are off. Go home." And it's a guy in a hot air balloon with um, dynamite sticks attached to a rope. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. I love that. I I but think it makes it, me sad. I, I 
I wish our military was like good. Like I joke about all this stuff, but like I feel deeply ashamed. So <laughs> like, why would you? You're you're a tiny little like in terms of population, you're a tiny little country. You well, know? I mean, we have a we have a greater population than Poland. We're on equal terms with Ukraine in population. Well, if anything, really? I think our population. Uh, well, Ukraine was forty five million before the war, and oh, we're yeah. at forty million. But keep in mind how many people died and how many people also fled. Like, we have a greater population than Ukraine. We're far greater than Poland by at least three or four million. Poland, yeah, would, yeah. Poland would eat us up and chew us alive. I, th- I think that the United States, Canada, and Mexico have such, like, a God-given opportunity. Like, we are the best countries like on paper that could possibly exist. We're next to two, like each of us is next to two For, other like survival of the species. Right? Excellent countries. We're all friends. We're, we've all got great resources. You know, at least the United States and Mexico have good populations, good human capital. And then the United States and Canada have great infrastructure and technology, you know, like, why do we let the old world dictate what we care about? It should be the three of us. And then, you know, you let the rest of the Americas sort of have half a vote. And that I should be it. We need a North American I Union. I come. Uh, but you mentioned, um, oh, both of you sort of brought this up tangentially, the idea of sort of like free riders. Um like Canada. You know, Canada doesn't need to spend a lot of money on defense because, like I said, I think it's the only country that, put, when push comes to shove, the U.S. absolutely, 100 out of 100 scenarios, would defend Canada from a foreign invader. Um, because it's, it's just too... It would imperil the United States. more than Now, the there's other plenty country. of countries that, just based off of, like, alliances and guarantees of sovereignty, also reach 100 out of 100. And that's like... Ireland and Germany and Denmark and Sweden and Norway, like a hundred out of a hundred times, the United States will defend them. But that's only because, you know, 85 out of a hundred times the United States defends them, but 86 out of a hundred the UK does and France and whatever, like the, the mix, mix mash of like alliances gets them all to the same level. Yeah. So I, I, this was actually, I think, in a Poland Ball comment section, comic comments section recently, where I was talking about how, um, uh, I, I don't know who I was talking with, but the idea of free riders coming up, uh, sort of, you know, taking advantage of other states spending a lot of money on defense, right? And so Ireland, I think, was the example that people sort of complained about, saying that, you know, Ireland, you know, they barely have an armed forces at all. Uh, because they can take Bicycle advantage of their, cavalry. yeah, they, like they they take advantage of their their geopolitical position, right? Like they're an island, and there's a much bigger nuclear capable power that can defend them, right? So it's like, why do they need to spend money on defense when there are no conceivable threats to them in the first place? And any conceivable threat that might exist would be handled by the UK, right? Historically, it was the UK that was that threat, right? And it's not anymore. Um, so like, yeah, fair play to them. Like why spend money on that when you don't need to? Like, I totally understand that. But I also understand like the other side of that is that the UK, um, and you know, other members of NATO, for example, are justifiably upset that Ireland basically gets the benefits of NATO membership without being a part of it. Right. So it's, you know, the Irish are, uh, you know, seeking their own self-interest by being a free rider on sort of security issues. But at the same time, like when the rest of us in NATO complain about Ireland being a free rider and saying that they should contribute to defense, that's also us pursuing our own states, our state's own interests by getting them to collect, uh, to, to uh, contribute to collective defense, right? So, you know, fair play to all involved. Like those are all valid arguments depending on your own perspective. Yeah. Well, no, and it raises. It raises an interesting point too, right? Because like Canada, we love to suck on your titty. But also, we could pull an Ireland. We could pull out a NATO if we wanted to. Because like Ireland, you would still defend us. 
and then keep in mind too i think what what do we spend on our gdp i think it's like 1.2 1.4 we're one of the lowest in nato and i know trudeau just recently said in the last few months he was like we will never spend two percent on our defense yeah so I, yeah I we're freeloaders like... but keep in mind i think like yeah our percentage is not satisfactory but when you look at the overall, you know, money number, I think we're the eighth highest spender just because of our population and our GDP. So you have all these countries like you know, Estonia, Latvia, who everybody calls little bulldogs because they spend like three, four percent or whatever on their of their GDP. But Canada, a freeloader, we still are worth, you know, 15 Estonias, even if we're freeloading. Yeah, uh, it's just... Uh... <laughs> Here's what I yeah. think about a lot, right? What is the value of an F-16 or whatever the modern fighter is, right? There are two categories of cost when it comes to those. There is the cost of the raw materials, the iron, the aluminum, the titanium, whatever. And then there is the cost of the human input that is the labor that for military equipment in the United States is mostly American labor, right? That's the majority, the vast majority of cost. So military expenditure in the United States is not building F-16s. It's giving Kentuckians a job making screws and lug nuts so that we can have F-16s. It's a welfare program. We're spending 10% of our GDP but it's not going into buying silicon from the Philippines. It's going into paying some, you know, Oklahoman to put screw threads on a washer for no reason, right? So, you know, it's just our economy. That's what we do. Yeah, or I know that um, a big percentage of our military uh, expenditure in Canada is spent on ex-soldiers' pensions. And we purposely include that. So we'll be like, oh, yeah, we're upping our military expenditure from 1.2 to 1.4. But really, that extra 0.2% is literally just increasing bonuses to pensions of soldiers. So it, it looks good. Um... Yeah, the, the, the greatest war in Canada, Canadian 21st century history is the war on increasing rent. Yeah, big words from somebody who never fought in World War One. Oh, right, you guys fought for three months or something. Yeah, well, I, it was the most important three months, okay? Um, I, I, no, I just watched, uh, like, oh, geez, yesterday I was really sick, and I spent all day in bed watching documentaries about the Somme. I'm really interested in that battle. And I was actually thinking about you guys, and I was like, dang, like, what do Americans think about World War I? Like, what did they even fight in? I, I was in a YouTube comment section yesterday, and uh, they were like, well, Americans technically won World War I because, like, we supplied the British and everything. But realistically, if you look at World War I, the British were never actually short on supplies. They had the entire colonies to draw upon. If anything, they were short on manpower, and that was in the beginning of the war. By the time they fought the Somme, which was 1916, and the Somme was the bloodiest battle of World War One, and I think it was the bloodiest battle in the world up until uh, Stalingrad, I want to say, or Kursk, or yeah. the the Rezhev, uh, the Rezhev salient meat grinder. So I'm always interested in what Americans think about World War One because I know you guys consider yourselves like a decent part of it, but realistically, you only fought for what three, four months, and your supplies to the British Empire were important, but I wouldn't say they were a game breaker. Because, yeah. like I said, they were... So, I live in Kansas City, and this is where the National World War I Museum and Memorial is, and I've been there a few times. Um, it's a good museum, if you're American and in the region, but the American perspective is twofold. The first is that America saved the day and we came into World War I and we finished things off. We helped, you know, eliminate the Hun, whatever you want to say. Um, but then the other more realistic side is that the United States was a uh, economic, industrial, 
benefit to the allies or the Entente, and we had more value for Britain and France and Russia as a, you know, arms producer than we did a military power. So, you know, in textbooks, whatever, the United States is made out to be sort of a hero, but realistically, we care more about World War II because we were more involved. We wouldn't, I don't think that the Allies would have won World War II without the United States. World War I could have been won by the Entente with just the United States as a economic ally, if that makes sense. See, we were, we were always taught that Canada single-handedly won the First World War. Um, <laughs> Passchendaele, Vimy, Passchendaele, Vimy Ridge. Canada punched well above its weight, like 100%. Absolutely was more value than it cost the British Empire to maintain. But yeah, Canada never lost yeah. a battle in World War One. I. I know the Australians also like to uh stroke themselves off a little bit, but whenever they do that, I just say, Hey, what about Gallipoli? Yeah, the Australians were glorified cannon fodder, the co- the Canadians were glorified cannons. That's the difference. Yeah, I think I have a comic about Australians bragging about winning World War One, and then some Turkish person laughing at them, or something like that. Yeah, but, I, um, I, no, I, I'm I'm early of the belief that Canada single handedly won the First World War. You you now, had a whole means, beach in Normandy, so like the Second World War, you weren't out of account. You know? Did you know actually that um, I went to that beach? Funnily enough, Juno. I have a bunch of sand I collected from there. Apparently, it was supposed to be called Jelly Beach, but Churchill said that that would be um, denigrating, and they renamed it. Once again, Churchill was right. That's yeah, good job. It's like, how, how are we supposed to send thousands of men to their deaths on a beach called Jelly? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with, with basically everything Gaynor said about World War I. Um, I am less familiar with World War I than I am with World War II. Um, like Gaitner said, I think Americans are more familiar with World War II just because uh, we were more involved, but also um, like the scale was on another level from World War I, and it was more definitive, right? Like, I World think War I was not sort of, the result was not definitive, right? It's the main reason why we had World War II. Um, it no, didn't I think... establish a, a long-lasting peace. I think recently my interest, like I've gotten into a big World War One binge lately. Uh, my interest was peaked actually because of the Ukraine war, because I feel like the Ukraine war with these static, static lines, trench warfare, not, nothing really changes. You know, you have the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive, which created like what a tiny little salient to Robotine, very similar to, you know, the offensive at the Somme. Psalm cost, you know, 60,000 casualties in the first day. So I think um, my interest in World War I recently was very much piqued by the similarities to the Ukraine war because realistically, nothing is really moving. Like, I made that joke recently about, oh, let's make a podcast about the breakthrough at Ocheritine. But if you look at the map, it's the salient at Ocheritine is like, you know, they conquered a single road that led to this village and they expanded outwards uh, northeast and southwest by about, I want to say, 750 meters. Like, can you even call that a salient? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think that the war is just... I think that it's a product of the 21st century. Everything is moving incredibly slowly but the amount of information is at light speed there's so much information but nothing is happening from my perspective as somebody who doesn't follow this regularly it nothing has changed i don't know where the front lines are i don't really care it's i think the the last big it, it, honestly gate i'll tell you this the war you're right it doesn't really change you get Big battles like um, uh, the Russians, they took Bakhmut. That was a big one. 
and then after that, probably what six? Uh, no, I was uh, gonna go a little bit before that. Marinka. They uh, took it Marinka. doesn't doesn't quite meet the same scale as Bakhmut or Avdika, I think. But it was kind of it was important though. Marinka was a a city that was well fought for, kind of like Vuladar, but Vuladar hasn't fallen. Yeah. But Marinka was one of those ones that had been on the front line since 2014. And between Bakhmut and Avdivka, they did take Marinka. And that was a big talking point for the Russians. And then after Marinka, they took Avdika, Avdivka. Sorry. And the recent breakthrough at Ocheretine was leapfrogging off of the Abdivka offensive. And that was a like, like I followed the war and I look at the maps daily and the Abdivka salient, it didn't look uh, sustainable, but God damn, did they ever fight for it? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the importance of artillery superiority. Uh, in some, some of the, the worst uh, artillery ratios uh, in the past couple of months in Ukraine have been like 12 to one in some localized areas in Russia's favor. They're firing 12 shells for every one that the Ukrainians can. Um, yeah. You know, well, and we, it's very similar too, right? Like, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. But no, like no, even, go for it. Even before that, like, if you remember in the earlier days of the war, there was um, the battles of Severodonetsk and yep. Lysitansk. Sorry, I'm butchering that pronunciation, but it was very similar, right? Like, these hard-fought, grinding battles where the kind of Russians sort of envelop them in a pocket and the Ukrainians can fight as long as they can. And now we're kind of seeing the same thing in Shasev Yar, which was hugely important for the Battle of Bakhmut, which I think I mentioned earlier. Yes. Yeah, you did. Um, and you're right. It is. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the lack of air superiority on either side has, you know, essentially forced the front line in the war to be relatively unchanged for about, about two years. Uh, yeah, the Russians are taking more territory. Um, it's starting to ramp up a little bit, uh, but you know, the recently passed USA to Ukraine should help stave off uh, you know the Russian hordes a little bit. But um, you know, momentum is clearly on on Russia's side right now. But you know, like, what what are they getting out of this? You know, like the, the more sort of uh, I think interesting conversation to be had here is was this worth it? For Russia, and I don't. That's a different question from was it worth it for Putin? You know, I no, think, I totally agree. Like, how yeah. can it go from three days to Kiev to four months and twenty thousand dead to Avdivka, a place nobody had ever heard before? Like, yeah. it's like kind of like how we were talking about that meme earlier about the Chad face and Ukrainian geography. Like, we're talking about this place, Chassis VR. Like, it's important realistically we we would never have heard of it before it's just some town of yeah. like uh pre-war uh 17,000 i want to say and we're acting like it's like some linchpin like the new stalingrad oh the russians are going to attack chasivyar like i think that's a big fall from grace honestly like and the russians will twist that and be like oh yeah well we we took avdivka and chasivyar but if you're bragging about that is that necessarily a victory it's like America invading Canada, and instead of bragging about taking Ottawa, you're bragging about taking like Chatham. Yeah, yeah, I don't even know where that is. It's a perfect analogy. Yeah, Chatham is a town that's like, uh, who probably one hour from the New York Niagara border. Oh, okay. Population, yeah, like, like, yeah. yeah, population um, five thousand. Yeah, like it, it's. I, I sort of oscillate between two different positions of like clowning on Russia for like being just incompetent and like unable to, you know, take territory from uh, a much smaller and weaker and poorer opponent. But at the same time, like Ukrainians are punching well above their goddamn weight. You know, like they've been nothing short of heroic in this war, like across the board. The fact that Ukraine has been able to put up such of a, such a vicious fight is remarkable. Like, I I I feel for every element of Ukrainian society for what Russia has done unjustifiably, immorally, um, and you know I wish we could do more. That's easy for me to say, you know, from the safety of my apartment in uh, in the United States. But 
it's just absolutely obscene what Russia has been allowed to get away with. And I, I, you know, I mentioned this earlier, I think, that uh, you know, if I were president, maybe wrongly, I'd be a lot more hawkish on Ukraine. Because like I said, it's, I, I think it is the single most important thing that has been happening for the past two years in, in human civilization. Because it, it is directly informing what may or may not happen over Taiwan. And no, I agree. It, like, yeah, you know, a bigger piece of the the larger international system and, and where it's going in the next several decades. I refuse to move from the position that Russia is simply incompetent. So you know, it's not a difficult decision for me to make. I don't think that Ukraine is particularly special. I think that Ukraine or that Russia is just incapable of doing anything. Um, I think, honestly, since Bakhmut, they have gotten more competent. Yes. most. It, it, it seems like since they drifted from using Wagner and having to use their own forces, they're not only have they learned, but I think there's a, that, a dissonance, right? It's that one only thing lasts to say, so long. They used Wagner for a reason, because they don't have the capacity to train and to maintain a fighting force themselves. No. Oh, well, I disagree. I think they have... Like, keep in mind, right, like, uh, I'm very tied in with Russians just because my girlfriend's a Russian and her 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 brother lives in Russia and he was a really good friend of mine and he tells me stuff. But basically, there was a dissonance, right? When you have Wagner, you have basically prisoners, people that they were trying to purge from society getting paid very little. And it's easy to just send them to go die and save the Russian forces. And I think while they were using Wagner for the majority of their assaults in places like, you know, like the Battle of Popozna, uh, especially Bakhmut, you get rid of these kind of people. And I think they had time while they were using Wagner to learn from their mistakes from the initial 2022 invasion where their army was straight up caught with their pants down. And they reconstituted their forces. And I have a hard time saying that the current Russian army, as it is, is incompetent. I think that their strategy is, now that they're using actual Russian forces, people who aren't criminals, people who are cared about by, you know, people back at home in Russia, their strategy now is more to grind down the tip of the Ukrainian spear, which we especially saw with the 2023 June counteroffensive, yep. where they got rid of the best Ukrainian forces using Wagner. And I know they have these Storm Z units, which are made of prisoners, but they're a lot less pervasive and significant than the Wagner was. So, sorry, I rambled on. But like, what I'm saying is basically... The Russians have learned they and they also kicked up their economy to a wartime economy. So I think to call them incompetent now is disparaging a little bit. And I feel like it kind of disses the Ukrainians a little bit. Yeah, it it, um, it belittles the threat that they're facing. I agree. Yeah, like um, I think the Russian strategy right now is attrition. Yes. Like it is like I, I, I bring up the Somme because I just watched all those documentaries. It was the British strategy, right? The British knew they had the men, they had the gear. They knew that they had endless supplies of Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, Indians, et cetera, et cetera. And they could grind down the Germans and they could especially grind down their best forces. And I think that was what the Russians were doing during the counteroffensive. And now that the best Ukrainian forces are essentially they're either dead, wounded, or they're all spread out along the front. Because uh, the ones that got trained by NATO, there weren't that many. Most of them got uh, dusted in the counteroffensive. So now they need these guys with the, the really good training. And they're spreading them across the front. So collectively, as a number, they're not really going to do much. They're going to lead the conscripted Ukrainians as best they can. But they're no longer like a singular force, right? Like I remember they were hyping up these NATO trained uh, 47th Brigade guys to lead the counteroffensive and like failed. And yeah. we, we've all seen the horrible videos, like it didn't go well. So now they're diluting the talent 
to keep the new conscripts somewhat uh, competent, I guess. But as a whole, they're no longer effective. But but yeah, you're talking I, about Russia, one of the largest countries in the world in terms of population and land area and resources and economic output against Ukraine, and they can't make very large strides in the war. And Ukraine has the same population as Poland. So what hope does, does Russia have of doing anything against Ukraine outside of Russia's, what they're doing now? Russia's output economically is, I think, equal or less than Canada. And definitely yeah, it's about the size of Italy. Texas. Yeah, it's less than Texas. I know that for sure. And it's about on par with Canada. I think yeah. considering that, I think they're doing pretty well. Like, I mean, when's the last time you heard about a Ukrainian breakthrough? Yeah, it's, I, I, it's also important to remember that the Ukrainian state is being propped up by the European Union, the United States, Japan, Canada, Australia, South Korea, um, you know, the sort of heart of the Western liberal order, as it were, right? Like, this war would be very different if the EU and the US did not sort of provide the economic aid and military assistance that they have. Now, that's not to say that like we provided enough, but um, Ukraine as a state will continue to exist uh, because they've had the support from uh, the EU and the US primarily to sort of resist Russian aggression to the so, degree that they have. So now, is like, Russia's only hope that it is limited to Ukraine and the amount of external support that Ukraine can get? Yeah, they're not moving... They're not moving past the Dnieper. Yeah, I, and, I think that's, that's the hard, the hard like ceiling on what they can conceivably win. And that's me. That's me being very generous to the Russians. Yes, I also agree with that. Like, they're they're not moving past that. And if they even get that close, I'll eat my shorts. Yeah, I agree with with basically everything Aaron has said. I think um, I also want to point out that. A lot of Russian military campaigns throughout the years sort of started similarly, where they underestimated their opponents and you know weren't really ready for the kind of war that they ended up fighting, but they sort of shaped up over time. Like world War II is probably the quintessential example where they got caught on the back foot, didn't really understand what the hell they were doing. They were not ready for that war, uh, but eventually figured out how to fight that war. Now, granted, there's a lot of different sort of nuances that go into that, including, you know, aid from the British Empire, from the United States, for example. Um, but, you know, they, they figured out how to fight a modern war in, like, 1943, 1944. Russia now, just has the capacity to make those changes. Yes, because they have the strategic depth and they have a large population. And they have, they have the, the like population centers and industrial centers away from any front line that they could like feasibly have yeah now if we want to get like super sort of reductive to the ukrainian perspective like what does this even mean for russia in the large scheme of things like this doesn't really move the needle in the terms of like the international system like the, the looking at it very cynically like what territory they've conquered what they've been able to win from the war is like totally inconsequential to the greater international system it just, it's not important, right? Like the Donbass and Ukraine and, or sorry, Crimea, um, uh, Zaporizhia, um, these are not like super important areas in the grand scheme of things, right? No, like, no, here, here's a question. They're to Ukraine, obviously, but like, and, and to Russia for that matter. But um, this this goes back to what I was asking earlier. Like what, what did Russia win from this? So, like, assuming that the lines were to freeze here, was this worth it for Russia? I would say absolutely not. Was it worth it for Putin? Yes. Yeah. I, I guess one question that I would have, and this relates back to our like earlier topic of East and Southeast Asia, is are allies and friends in the international system more valuable than territory? Because Russia doesn't have friends. They don't have allies besides Belarus and, you know, whatever, like tiny in consequential country there is. China doesn't really have any friends. The United States has endless friends and allies, right? 
So is, is there any benefit for Russia or China to have new territory? That doesn't, to me, seem very valuable. It doesn't seem like a long-term solution to a lack of like power or a lack of influence. Yeah, it, it, I mean, that's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think for a country like China or Russia, territory itself does not matter. These are massive countries that are basically impervious to invasion from foreign powers, right? Like, I understand that the Russians might have a different perspective on this because they have been subject to invasion in the past, you know, whether it was the Nazis, whether it was, you know, Imperial Germany, whether it was Napoleon, right? Like, yeah, there's a very long history of fighting on Russian soil. The problem is that, not the problem, rather, the difference is now that Russia is a nuclear power, right? Nuclear weapons completely change the game strategically. Um, if you have nuclear weapons, you can impose an enormously high cost on any potential invader to make it not worth it, which means that territory itself doesn't matter beyond having like a symbolic victory, right? Like Putin is very much a modern day czar. He cares about his strongman image. He wants to be remembered as like this great Russian leader uh, who expanded Russian influence and power and, you know, uh, brought these countries that were formerly in the Russian sphere of influence back into the fold. He doesn't like the idea of like that he's concerned with NATO states uh, you know, being closer to the Russian border or Ukraine becoming like a democratic, successful state. I don't think he gives a shit about any of that. I think it's straight up like he is an autocrat. He is a tyrant in the way that humankind has had since the dawn of civilization. Like he is not fundamentally different from the other kinds of leaders that we have had for the majority, if not almost all of human history. Like this is the norm. People like Putin and Xi Jinping and your other two big dictators, that is the norm for human governance, where you have a very strong uh, king, emperor, uh, czar, whatever you want to call it, a central figure uh, with an ego the size of the goddamn moon. You know, like it's, it's very par for the course. So the territory is symbolic. It makes them feel better about themselves, about their own ego. It, it inflates, it feeds their ego. But strategically, no, the Donbass and Crimea don't matter because a war between Russia and NATO, for example, is incredibly one-sided, but at the, you know, it, it doesn't even matter because like NATO has no interest in, in going to war with Russia, right? NATO is a defensive alliance. Russia doesn't have anything that we could, you know, potentially want uh, to even launch an aggressive war over if we wanted to, you know? Same thing with well, Taiwan and China. Like these things, in the grand scheme of things are just, uh, places on a map for these dictators to say that they own. I know that in Crimea and just the oceans around Crimea, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, whatever, they found a lot of offshore resources. And during the beginning of the war, I know people were saying, oh, well, that's part, probably why Putin wants to invade because, you know, he doesn't want Russian oil to get diluted and have other customers, so he's going to take Ukrainian oil. But as the war has gone on, and especially after listening to that fucking unhinged interview with Tucker Carlson, I do believe that it has nothing to do with that. I think it's Putin's little passion project. Like, I like to draw my own little topographical maps, and I feel like it's Putin's own version of that. I, I think that everything that we've said in the last couple of minutes is absolutely true so i will leave us all with one final question and that is you know we've we've all been involved especially you two coli and aaron uh involved with poland ball for the last decade so you know it's 2024 in 2034 what country do you think will be the warmongering international laughing stock but of all Poland ball jokes that you think the next generation or even yourselves in your old age will be making comics about? Is it the United States, Russia, China, Israel, Puerto Rico? Aaron, how about you? United States. Yeah, probably the United States. Um, but not by virtue of the United States being, you know, significantly like more cartoonish warmongering than like Russia or China or whatever. Um, it's just by virtue of it being sort of the indispensable country, right? Like it's just, it's everywhere all the, it's, it, it's in every part of the planet 
all the time. There's just more opportunities for it to fuck up, you know? So I think we'll be clowning on American foreign policy in 10 years as hard as we were 10 years ago, as hard as we are today. To be honest, I really hope that we're clowning on American foreign policy because if we aren't, we're living in a very dangerous future. Yeah, that's another good point. You know, it's uh, people might not like, you know, the, the current international system, and I'll be the first to say it's not perfect. And if the United States falls incredibly short of the values it purports to uphold, but it's the only country at present that can sort of hold together some kind of international system. Um, the British Empire wasn't capable of doing it. China and Russia are not capable of doing it. The world would be much worse off if uh, we fall into a, a multipolar system, which is something I've said several times. Uh, no, believe it or not, I'm one of the biggest Amerophiles you'll ever see, right? Like, I grew up in Oklahoma. You know, hey, y'all, I'm fixing to go to the mall. Very good. Yeah, so I don't want to live in a world where America is not king. Because I know all the teeny boppers and little high school communists and whatever. They'll all be like, oh, America's shit, whatever. They fucking killed Vietnamese people and destroyed communists and ruined Latin America and they fund Israel. But what's the alternative? Yeah. The alternative is World War One and World War II because that's immediately what preceded it. Well, I think it'll be more like uh, that 1933 war between Japan and China. With that, I thank you very much for listening to the Poland Ball podcast. We will pick back up in 2032 with the election uh, between Malia Obama and Barron Trump. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode when we talk about something else that we're not qualified to talk about. Thank you.